So if this is coming from me, you can notice that I am very skilled at coloring, aren't I? <coughs> and I didn't know this, but um, coloring for adults is an in thing to be doing now. Do they make these color books for adults to color? And then sometimes they have parties, you know, a bunch of women will get together for a party and it will be a color party of sorts. And uh, I think there's better things you could do with your time, but uh, I like that. But notice this right here. Just notice it. I want you all to see it. I want you to see what it's going to be transformed into. Okay, in just a second here. Okay. Just almost done. Just going to make all the final touches on it. I love you. Coming from a two-year-old. This is perfect, isn't it? And what would you do with this if your two or three-year-old child or grandchild came up to you and said, I love you, and hands you this picture? What would you do with this picture? Where would it go? It'd go on the fridge. All of them go on the fridge, right? And, uh, you know, I was looking in our house today or yesterday, as a matter of fact, in our kitchen, and we've got all of these different ornamental cutouts and stuff like that that our kids made. And they've all been laminated. Why? Because they want to be able to save, Pam wants to save them from year after year after year. And I kind of sat back in the living room when she started putting these up on all the cabinets. And I, I thought to myself, when is she going to run out of laminated stuff? And I don't think she's going to run out. But this is what would go on a fridge. And what would it communicate to that mom from that little boy? Love, right? I love you. His best ever portrait right there. I love you. And with that then, we come into this Colors of Christmas series today. And I want you to know we started out with red because I want us all to be able to understand what red means in this story of Christmas. And literally what it means is, I love you. I mean, that's what Jesus did for us. He came and he died and he rose again on the third day, all because he wanted us to know that you are loved. You're loved by God Himself, the very Creator of the earth. You are loved deeply by Him. Even if you color outside the lines a little bit in your life, it doesn't matter because God says, I'll take care of that. I'm going to show you what real love looks like for sure. If you've got a Bible, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. It just happens to be, it seems like we're all all over Ephesians in our studies today. And I want you to notice something. This is a gift given from a young child to their mother. But one of the ways that we live with this and we kind of challenge ourselves with this is to remember this little phrase, okay? That you cannot, you cannot give love until you've been able to experience the art of giving love, okay? Or of receiving love. Let me say it that way. You cannot give love until you have been able to receive love. And lots of people, they don't do very well at receiving love at all. And uh, they want to give it, but they don't know how to receive it. And it kind of brings this disconnect into what we're thinking about in terms of the colors of Christmas. So, you cannot give love if you're unable to receive love. And sometimes it's a breakdown in our own lives. Sometimes it's a breakdown in our relationships with other people. And it also is a breakdown in our understanding of God, of our understanding of God. And here's what I'm talking about. If I talk about love with you completely as a group of people, then I'm going to say that God is love, because that's what the Bible says. God is love. And yet, some of you are sitting there, and you're thinking to yourself, he may be love, but I don't think he can love me. Matter of fact, I'm not even sure there is such a thing as God's love. And where we're going with this is, is that a lot of us look at the lens of love through the lens of skepticism. We're skeptics. Skeptics really believe that God could not love them. And for many people, that's just a bar that's way, way too high. It's a supernatural impossibility. Or at least the unlikely proposition that God could love you. You think to yourself, if he knew everything that I have done, there is no way he could love me. It's like you're saying that God cannot be loving enough to save you. 
God cannot be loving enough to reach out to you and to pick you up. God cannot be loving. And so you've kind of checked out of that a little bit. You've kind of decided that that isn't going to be where your life is going to be characterized. And so you have a lot of skepticism. And then some people are so ashamed of their past that they can't see a future with God. And boy, I run into this all the time in talking with people. You talk about God loves you and he's sent Jesus to save you and all of that. And inevitably it will come up, well, God, I'm not even sure God knows all the stuff I've done. You sure don't know all the stuff I've done. And honestly, people think, they think, this will disqualify me from receiving God's love. All of my past, it can't go deep or higher or broader, as Romans chapter 8 says. You refute what Romans chapter 8 says by saying it just cannot be possible for me. And what it ends up being is, is that we end up thinking along the lines of, when I get my act together... I'll come to God and receive his love. And you've heard me say this before, because some of you say this on a regularly, regular basis. You've heard me respond to you very carefully, but firmly. How's that working for you? I mean, really, how is it working for you to set aside all of the stuff in your life and basically to say to God, your love is not deep enough to handle the issues I've got in my life? And it's simply not true. It's a lie. Then we also believe a lie that says, I have to be good enough to earn my way to heaven. And you'd be surprised how many people are Christians who really believe that. That I've got to knock off every checkbox that there is, and I've got to be better than I've ever been before in order to receive salvation. And that's just a common mistake. And the common mistake really is that people base their relationship with God on how many good things they can do. And if they do enough and get the balance right or get a good side outbalancing the bad side, maybe God will take me in and make me part of a, um, you know, part of a party in heaven for all those who earned a lot. You know, if you base your relationship with God on how good you are and how much you have done to earn it, you end up finding out that that's a, really a fallacy. And God loves you no matter whether you've done good or bad. That does not change what is important to him in you at all. And yes, you may have to repent and you may have to change directions of your life, but the reality is that when you do that, God opens up his arms and says, I love you. Now, when I was working in college, and uh, most of you know that I spent two or three summers, I guess three summers, working in road construction. And one summer, I was working on a road project, yeah, the Interstate 5, just south of Eugene there. And my dad was the project manager, which means I got a job whenever I wanted it. But dad wouldn't necessarily give me the best job. So one summer, in the early six weeks of the summer, I literally spent every day taking rocks about this high and putting them in a basket. Rocks in a basket. Rocks in a basket. That could be a hip-hop song, couldn't it? You know, rocks in a bag. I did that for six weeks. And I got so tired of that. I got to where I was dreaming about rocks. You know, and, and this is true. When you do so much repetitive stuff, it shows up in your dreams. And so I kind of asked my dad. I said, Dad, I think I'm doing really good at the rocks. Is there another job that maybe I could have? And he didn't say much at all because he didn't want to be uh, accused of paving the way to a better job, but somehow I ended up with my second job that summer, which was flagging the cars on the interstate, which meant yield, stop, yield, stop. And after about three weeks of that, I was wishing that I could have my rocks back, you know, and do that. So I complained to my dad about this, and I said, Dad, this just isn't right. I, I'm doing really good at this, but I think I'm worth more to you than just putting rocks in a basket or holding a sign. He said, you know what, you are. And I said, well, I'm not trying not to complain, but I really would like a different job. And you're the boss, so can I get a different job? And Dad said, yeah, yeah, you can get a different job. Show up at the rock crusher tomorrow at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, and they'll tell you what they need you to do. And so the first day, literally what I ended up doing was crawling up underneath this rock crusher and trying to ungum some of the belts in there because rocks had gotten in there and caused them to, to not work right. And when it got into the afternoon and it was 80, 90 degrees and you're crawling on your belly, 
in this rock crusher with a bunch of rocks all over you. You see a theme there? It's rocks, uh, you know, there. You know, then, then I was asking Dad, can I, can I stop doing this? I don't want to do this anymore. And my dad said, no, you're going to college in a couple of weeks. And, and then he would look at me and he'd say, you are going to college, right? I said, well, yeah, I'm going to college. You bet. After this summer, there's no way I want to work road construction the rest of my life. And he said, that was good because that's why I gave you those jobs was to make sure that you didn't get so used to the money that you decided you didn't want to go back to college. But instead, you'd go back to college and figure out what you want to do with your life. And it probably wasn't going to be road construction. And believe it or not, I did. I did that. And I figured out so that the next summer, this would have been the third summer, I didn't go to work for my dad at all. And I did some different things. But you know, I think sometimes we're really guilty of trying to earn our way into the good graces of God. And we do this without really thinking about the impact on our own soul. These are lies that I just told you about. They're lies that speak loud and clear in our lives. I really doubt that God can unconditionally love me. And there are some of you in this room that feel that way, and you wrestle with that every day. You really doubt that God could ever really love you. You're a skeptic, and I get that. Or it could be my past is so bad that God's love cannot break through. And I wonder, you know, when I look at different people and also people in the Bible, a lot of those people that came to become followers of Jesus, they had bad pasts too. So I guess I want to say to you with all gentleness but firmness, what makes you so special? Is it really true that you would say that God's love could never cover the past and the sins in my life? Because if you really believe that, then you really believe that God's love is not enough. And yet the Bible is full of how it is enough. And not only is it enough for all of us, it's also free. It's free. And we don't operate well in that world, especially when we're thinking about God, because we want to go with our lists and stand before God and say, here's my list, welcome me into the kingdom. And God says, throw your list away. You don't really want that list. You really don't want that list. Instead, why don't you just come on the basis of knowing my son? This creates all kinds of tension in our lives when you think about it. I was reading a story this week, and it was kind of an interesting story. It was about a little boy whose dad was a preacher, and uh, they didn't have tons of money at all, but they lived in this town, and this little boy was getting older. He's like seven, eight maybe nine years old at the time. And one of the things that he loved to do was to play these board games that were strategy games. And he thought that was the coolest thing. And so he started saving up his money because he was going to go to the game store and buy one of these strategy games. And it seemed like a good thing. And dad thought, well, yeah, this is a good thing. And so he took his son to the game store one day and they, they operated all inside of the game store trying to find the game and could not find the game at all. And so... They searched some more, and the little boy went from aisle to aisle, and the guy that was the owner of the shop was in the store at that time, and he saw this happening, and so he went and asked the guy, what are you looking for, young man? And he said, well, I'm looking for this strategy game, and it comes in three different sizes, and uh, I was hoping to get one because I've saved my money to do this. And the owner of the store said, well, no. I'm sorry, but they discontinued this game in the last year, and it no longer exists. And, of course, the boy's heart just sunk because he finally had enough money to get one of those three big things, and he just looked, and he said, well, you've got to have one. And the owner of the store said, well, I don't think we do. I'll tell you what, let me go in the back and see. I shoved a bunch of stuff off in a corner. Maybe, maybe that would be what you're looking for. And so he went back out, and he came back out, and he came out with this big, giant strategy board game. Now, it came in three sizes. It came in the $35 size. It came in the $50 size, $50 to $100. And it came in the $500 size. Now, get the picture here. The boy, his eyes just got that big. And he's thinking, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to me. But imagine what his preacher daddy was thinking. There ain't no way I'm going to give him 500 bucks to buy this game at all. And so the preacher daddy was trying to figure out how to let his son down you know, slowly and easily because it just wasn't going to work out because this was the big, the big kahuna, if you want to say it that way. And so there was a little bit of a conversation, and he, the dad told the guy, I can't pay that kind of money. And he said, yeah, I know, that's, 
It's kind of a problem, isn't it? But this is the $500 game. But, and then he kind of got this smile on his face, and he said, this $500 game was given to me as a demo. And he says, since I got it from somebody for free, why would I not give it to somebody for free? And so he gave the game to the, to the boy, and of course the dad was sitting off the side, and he was trying to figure out how much is this going to cost me? How much is this going to cost me? What do I have to do to earn the right to have this game? And lo and behold, the owner of the store said, it's free. It's free. You need to take this, and you need to use it. I want to give this to you. You know, when you think about it, you have those kinds of conversations, I think, with God all the time. That when God comes to you and gives you something that is absolutely free, that you cannot earn at all, that would be our salvation for sure. If you can't earn it, it is totally free, and you have to receive it. And, uh, and that goes back to what I was talking to you about earlier, that you cannot give away love until you've received love. Receive the love of God. That's where it starts, for sure. The store owner had demonstrated what happens when someone re receives love and then decides to give it away. And if you want to know the love that the Father has for you, don't buy into the lies that there's no one, even this side of God, that could really love me, and I don't think God could either. Don't buy the lie that says somebody, that God could love somebody like me, maybe, but maybe not. And don't buy the lie that you have to earn God's love. Because you don't, it's free. As we start this Christmas series, talk about the colors of Christmas, we're talking about love, that's what all the red is up here. We're talking about trying to understand that the love of God is free to you and to me, and we do not need to corrupt it with trying to earn it at all. Don't do that. Instead, receive it, and then give it away. And if you do that, you really run into something pretty su successful, I think. So every one of us is on a, on a journey, right? And we're all on this journey, and as it applies to this message right here, I want to give you four statements. I think they're in your bulletin. Four statements that we need to cross over the threshold with and understand in a right way. First of all, does God's love really exist? It's a fair question, I think, especially in this world. I think all of us ask that question from time to time, and it's really true that God is the God of love. He, his love transcends everything that's in our life. And he loves us. Listen to how the Bible says it. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we have loved, but that God has loved and he loved us and sent his son as atoning sacrifice for our sins. God showed that he was love. Here's how another Bible writer puts it. It's Paul. He says it this way, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates, that's the word there, that's key in there, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this whole idea that I got to get my life together and i got to get it all lined up just right in the right way before I really come to God. Listen, your perfection does not even touch the greatest, the greatest love that there ever was. You can get perfect, and you can have all the beautiful things in your life that you want to have, but you still have to come on the basis of holiness in your own heart that says, I want to know God. That's that. And, uh, and I think that's really a big question. The second question is this, does God really love me? Love me. Listen to how Paul puts it in the letter to the Ephesians. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, where you followed the ways of this world and the rulers of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, we were by nature objects of wrath. 
And just think about that a little bit. You think, well, here's what's happening. All of us come out of this place where we are sinful and where we have not lived our life the way that God wants us to live. And we are actually going to be able to say to people, because of the brokenness in our own soul, we say God's love cannot cover some of the bad things you've done. And you may even just simple, you know, bring it, bring it together around this thought, I am broken. And you know what Paul, the Apostle Paul would say? He'd say, yes, you are broken. You are really broken. But God has an answer to your brokenness. And I think that's a message that we all need to hear. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he is the one who will take us and lead us to the incomparable riches of his grace that was expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's what Mark talked about this morning, about incomparable riches. And that's where it really gets personal when you think about it. God is love, but God didn't develop love in his own soul in order to be superior to everybody else. He developed love in his soul to give it away. To give it away. And honestly, even beyond the whole idea of love and God and all of that, if you've received love in your, in your life... Are you giving it away to somebody along the way? Are you really sharing that love? And then when you realize that God is love and that he takes you right where you're at and you are broken and he's the one that brings you and puts you back together again, are you sharing that kind of love with other people? You think, well, I don't know exactly how to share love with other people and it's kind of hard and kind of weird and all those kinds of things. Let me listen to this. It says there that God takes broken people the most broken, and he brings them back to life through love. God takes lost people, the most lost people on this earth, and he finds them. God takes hurting people, the most hurting people that he can find, and he heals them. Some of you are broken. Some of you are lost. Some of you just hurt. And I want you to know that you can never have those things in your life and cause you to be so far removed from God that you can't feel and sense his love in your life. Because you can. The, God's gift of love is an unearnable gift. That's the third thing. I don't need to say a lot of this because I have already. But just remember what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says. For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It's the gift of God. That's God's gift to you, love. And the sooner you and I get over ourselves through faith and, or not, I messed up there, get over ourselves and quit trying to earn something that's unearnable, the sooner we can live really free and faithful lives in the one who loves us on all levels. God loves you. You don't need to doubt it. You don't need to be a skeptic at all. He loves you. Number four, God's love is meant to be a gift from him or from you to someone else. So I want to ask you this week here as you come, how are you going to show God's love that you've received to other people? And I think you need, and we all need to be, I'm, I need to be this way, have got to be brutally intentional about this. How am I going to show love to somebody this week? And uh, if we could, I'd have you... Go do that and then turn in a homework assignment. We'd see what those stories look like. But I'm telling you, there are people that really want to know what God's love's all about, and you are the vehicles for that. You are the ones that God uses because he's poured his love out on you, and now it's time then for you to receive that love and to give it to somebody else. For you are God's workmanship, a masterpiece, Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And in 1 John chapter 4, we read, Dear friends, since God loved us, we also love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we teach, or if we love each other, God's, lives, God's love lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. It's a gift. Now, when we come to... Uh, 
it's already started, you know, the television commercials for Christmas. And I'm, I'm sitting there the other day and I'm thinking, who really gives their spouse a $40,000 pickup? <laughs> Pam would if Pam could. But you know, I just see, and then, then there's this other commercial where there actually are two vehicles, one big pickup and another one, and she comes out and she lays stake to the, the pickup, and he wanted the pickup, but he didn't get the pickup at all. You know, you have these stories, these things that happen along the way. Well, this Christmas in 2019 could be the Christmas, maybe, I hope it would be for you, where you really let down your guard and you allow the love of God to invade your life. You do that. And when you do that, and we'll build on this the rest of this month with salvation and a couple other spiritual growth and one other, and we'll celebrate this season through the colors of Christmas. Today, it's red, which goes along with Christmas. He's got Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer. You know, so he's a star during Christmas, isn't he? For sure. And there are lots of other things that red kind of plays into that. But I like this message because it's about love. It's not about pickups and cars. It's not about reindeer or any other thing that goes along. It's just about love. It's about God's love. And God's love is your love because he gave it to you. And he loves you with all of his heart. And some of you are sitting right there and you're just, you're denying it. You just say, no, I don't think so. Yes, the Bible says that you are the recipient of God Almighty's love. Do not reject that love. Do not bury that love. Do not throw it around. Instead, receive it and then give it. And when you do that, God works deeply in your soul and in your life. Why don't you stand, if you would, please?